This is the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Blood Red Podcast on Friday. So Sean Bradbury is host, and I've got with me Paul Ghost and Ian Doyle. We're going to look at Jürgen Klopp's presser today, assess all that the boss said, look back at NK Dons in midweek, and of course look ahead to Sheffield United tomorrow. Uh, gents, how are we doing? Ghosty, you uh, had a good week, a good trip back from Milton Keynes? Good trip back, yeah. It's me, me, Ian Doyle and David Lynch. Uh, listened to a few tunes on the way back. We did. It's yeah. good for you, because you didn't do any driving. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's all true. Driving, yeah. Yeah. Three hours, um, got back about 2.30am, and uh, I wasn't in work the next day, was I? No, um, you were not. Uh, yeah, it was a good good night for for all concerned. A uh, number of young lads got a got his debut and um, plenty of experience backing that up. And good to see it mesh. And I think um, I think that kind of, that's the kind of team we'd probably like to see against Arsenal in the next round. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Before we go any further, we'd just like to say about MK Dons. The stadium is very nice. Yeah, uh, the facilities are good. Yeah. However. Two things. One, the Wi-Fi went off in the second half, which was extremely stressful for anybody working on the game. And the second thing is the the food they provided, as Paul will agree with me on this, uh, before the game they provided pies, which we had a choice of cheese pie, steak pie or chicken balti pie, which was good. And it would have been even better, though, had they actually provided any cutlery. Oof. So you try eating a very large <laughs> steak pie, a nice runny, gooey one, while unable to use a knife or a fork. Or a spoon. How, how did you manage? Well, I, I went for the chicken, uh, the chicken bolty one, and uh, and fashioned a kind of using the lid as some kind of <laughs> you know, <laughs> scooper, Dish. and uh, and, it, and it worked. So I, I was I was made up, but some of the others were very unhappy. Wow, plonked in the middle of a retail park as well, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. Well, to, uh, the whole Milton Keynes is just roundabouts, isn't it? It's like mm. the scam of the south, as I call it. It's but a very niche northwest reference. Itself. That is. <laughs> but you ticked off a new ground, so yes. you're happy, happy in that. I'm respect. happy, and it, as as I agree with Paul, the. Uh, Actual performance itself was fairly decent for a team that would have never played before. Uh, it had a very strong spine. You had a look at the midfield in particular. What was it? Mm. Lallana, Cater, and Oxley Chamberlain. Mm. But uh, it was Milner, uh, James Milner, playing left back, who was the you know the captain. He led by example, and it gave some of the youngsters a chance to to show what they could do. You're looking at Harvey Elliott, who you know I've, I've, we mentioned him in a pod earlier this week. That I've seen him quite a few times now for Liverpool at various levels, and he always just looks. I don't want to say class above, but he looks classy. You don't mm. think, oh, there's a 16-year-old lad who make you know becoming Liverpool's the youngest player ever to start a game for Liverpool. Uh, Curtis Jones looks like he's progressed massively in the past last 12 months. He's found himself a position playing on the left side of that front three. Uh, he's got a bit more confidence about him. Looks like somebody who can somebody who can be pressing for a first-team place. Certainly this season, I'm sure we'll touch on that in a bit from, from what Jurgen Klopp said in his presser. And then there was Kiana Hoover, or however, as he always gets typed in all of our stuff, <laughs> uh, pops in with a goal and he's somebody else. It's incredible to think. I just wrote something about him before. He's 17. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, know, I thought he was I thought he was older than that. He's still only 17. Mm-hmm. And I think he's 18 very soon, isn't he? Um, but, you know, the future is bright in that, in that respect for Liverpool. Well, let's start with that then. This obviously was one of the key things Klopp was discussing in his press conference today was the youngsters and how he thinks that they are Premier League ready, but they'll have to be patient and wait for their chance. Said all the right things, Ghosty, but who do you think of of everyone who was on show on Wednesday night, who do you think is closest to the breakthrough? I mean, Curtis Jones, uh, Milner was speaking about him after the game yeah. in, in your piece. He got man of the match, didn't he? And like, he's mm. he's even though he's 18, it kind of feels like... I don't know, like the others, are Elliot's 16, isn't he? Like uh, Dory's just said, Hoover's 17. He feels like a bit of an elder statesman, but he's still very young. And, and what was that? His second, second yeah. appearance? Yeah, his debut was uh, at Wolves in January. I was there for that one, and it was a tough night for him. Uh, he fared much better on Wednesday night. He was so willing to to attack the, the right back every t- every chance he got. And it, it was the same case as Jones you see for the under-23s and, and you've seen for the under-18s. And he's just taken on the armband, actually, for Neil Critchley's side. So... He's got that little bit of responsibility now on his shoulders in that team and he's just sorted his contract. He's got his first professional contract, so it looks as though everything's progressing swimmingly for him. Mm. Um, plenty of time on his side to develop and improve and there's a few things that he needs to work on. And James Milner said as much. He said there are times when you need to give him a rocket and there are times when you need to put a, your arm around his shoulder and just tell him that he can do what do what he does so well in the final third, but, but leave it in the final third. Don't be trying... Stuff in strange areas where you could lose it because you, this isn't youth football anymore. And he has appeared to have taken this kind of advice on board. I thought he was very good the other night. But to answer your original question, who do I think is closest to knocking on the first team door? I'd probably say Keanu Hoover at right back. Mm. I think long term, he's a centre back and he's got so much athleticism and pace and strength, um, which is why he can play at right back. And there's probably a position for him there at some point in the Liverpool team with. Basically, they've only got Alexander Arnold, haven't he, at this point? Um, Nathaniel Klein's out injured, and 
still yet to see what's going to happen with him long term. So I think possibly Hoover is is the one who's closest to featuring a bit more regularly in Jurgen Klopp's first team. Dougie, would you go along with that? I know uh, we discussed Harvey yesterday on, on the agenda. I agree 100% with that about, yeah. about Hoover. I think that he is somebody who probably will get, whether it's from the bench. Uh, you know, if, let's put it this way, if he was on that, OK, everybody's fit. Or if, if there are enough fit senior players, but if he was on the bench, say, on Saturday against Sheffield United, I don't think anybody would bat an eyelid, especially if he then had to come on for the last 20 minutes or whatever. I mean, bear in mind, Rafa Camacho mm. did that against Crystal Palace, didn't he? Yeah. Um, Any great, yeah. great block. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. What, Zaha? The, yeah, the one thing he did in his Liverpool career before <laughs> leaving. I think, I think uh, Hoover's Liverpool career will last an awful lot longer than Camacho's, to be fair, uh, if he wants it to, because I think he will get opportunities. But yeah, I think, I think what the interesting thing with the youngsters is that with that game on uh, Wednesday, you mentioned you were at the Wolves game. I wasn't at that one. But uh, Jones was in midfield, wasn't he, for that yeah, one? Yeah. And when you are in those central areas, because it was noticeable that the one Liverpool player, the youngster who perhaps didn't do as well as the others on Wednesday was Rian Brewster. Although for him personally, just actually playing after so long, waiting to yeah. actually make his game, that's a massive deal for him. And he'll, he'll play so many more better games than he did on, on, uh, on Wednesday. But all the others were playing in wide areas which is the responsibility isn't quite the same as, you know, it's a very, not limited position, but you are playing on the right, you are playing on the mm. left. You don't often come over to the right or the left. You're playing centre, you can be all over the place. There's a lot of ground to cover. So I think that that was something that helped Jones and helped Hoover and helped, helped Elliot. It's early days for all of them, but I'll put this question to both of you. Do you think what we saw in midweek and what we might hopefully see if, if they play more games, which I'm sure they will, they'll have extra opportunities in at least some of the cup competitions, you'd think... Do you think you can start saying that the summer transfer strategy has been vindicated a little bit in the sense that there was there was suggestions that you know a lot of these guys were, were on the cusp of breaking through and there were pathways there that you didn't want to block if you signed you know fringe players who were only going to stand between them and say the first team guys would you, would you go along with that Kirsty? To an extent, yeah. I mean, I think I think they're going to have to have a, a, a bit of a cup run, aren't they? Because otherwise, they're not they're not going to play. I mean, these games in the Carabao Cup, they are literally playing for their ne- next appearance, um, mm. which is going to be in the next round, in the next round, in the next round. So Arsenal at home, it's going to be a really tough one because you'd imagine Arsenal are going to put out, put out a similar kind of uh, strategy to Liverpool where they've got a little bit of experience with, with plenty of youth. So that's going to be a really interesting game. And um, if Liverpool can get through that one, then again, it's another chance for Brewster, um, Harvey Elliott and, and whoever else, you know, Sepp van den Berg, he come off the bench, didn't he? Um, so it's essentially just about how much of an impact can they make in, in these competitions. They're not going to play in the FA Cup until January, um, until the very earliest. So this is this is the big opportunity for them now in this competition. And so far, they, they look to have risen to the challenge because I thought I thought across the board, all the young lads played very well the other night. And uh, okay, it was only League One opposition, but it's against the League One team who've got designs on getting to the Championship. Um, even getting further than that, and they're full of experienced senior pros. So um, a very, uh, very good night for them. An important night in in their young careers. Mm. I think it's way too early to say that. Yeah, and I think the, they they kind of gave themselves away a little bit. Liverpool with what Pep Linder said before the game, where he said we were surprised by how good Harvey Elliott is when he started mm. training with the first team. So they didn't have any expectation, presumably, of him of him making many appearances this season. But he's forced his way into the reckoning, and I think. When Klopp's spoken about not wanting to disrupt the group or bring in players, but certainly when he's spoken about the pathway, he's, he's more or less spoken about Brewster, hasn't he? He's yeah. the one yeah. that they've been waiting on. So I think Liverpool, you know, the transfer window's gone now, but if Liverpool had gotten another forward, I wouldn't have been too upset. But the bonus is that it looks like, as you say, Jones and certainly Jones uh, and Elliot could, if there's an absolute emergency or they need players to be taken out of the firing line at certain times in the season they could come in and I don't think anybody would be too massively bothered but you know MK Dons are League One also they were a bit weirdly compliant I thought for the first hour mm. if they'd have done for most of the game what they did in the last 20 minutes then it would have been interesting to see what would have happened with yeah. Liverpool but but the other to think that the reason that they didn't is because Liverpool played so well first half and why did they play so well first half oh yeah it's because Elliot and Jones were playing so well mm. moving on to a well, I guess a, a much more senior man than the lads we've discussed so far, who did play well also and was back in the fold was Joe Gomez. Ghost, you spoke to him afterwards and caught a bit of a frustrated figure in what you were saying in terms of his lack of game time. But at the same time, I think he said all the right things, didn't he, about Matip and Van Dyke 
What, what did you make of that conversation? Yeah, it, it, he, he struck all the right notes, you're right. I mean, he did say he's frustrated not to be playing, which is understandable because I think he's started one game, has he, this, this season, one Premier League game. But um, he accepts that Van Dijk and Matip are the, are the, the right partnership at this point. Um, it's nothing you wouldn't expect a, a professional to say if, if, if he comes out and he says, oh, yeah, fair enough, they're playing and I'm happy just to... Had me time on the bench, you wouldn't really believe him, <laughs> or maybe he'd be lacking a bit of motivation. So, I thought it was fair enough. Um, the people are fortunate that they've got a, a very good centre half waiting in the wings of either Matip or Van Dyke pull up injured. And I thought it was good to see him back on the pitch. Um, it was interesting actually because I asked him about Harvey Elliott, and he said, I'm used to being the, the young one in the team, you know, 21, he's just turned 22. And he was looking at Harvey Elliott, he's six years <laughs> younger than him, and, and he was he had to take on a bit more seniority and a bit more responsibility because. There were so many young players out there. So I think that'll only help him, actually, in terms of uh, developing a bit more responsibility in the first team. And, uh, yeah, um, I, th- I thought he, he was spot on when he said. Mm. I think that's that's true of Gomez, isn't it, Dodi? He did kind of step up and I know he's one of the highest in your player ratings on the night. Do you think the whole situation with him and Matip, it's, well, it's been a fair fight, hasn't it? They were both there in the summer. They were both able to be the, the first-choice centre-half at the beginning of the season, and now Matip is the one who Gomez has got to displace. Do you think it's it's a case of Matip being undroppable and being good rather than any kind of dip in the form of Gomez? Well, I don't think there's, there's any arguments about that. I mean, you've also got to bear in mind that you know, Gomez was out for a very long time last season yeah. from December, and it took him quite a while to get over it. Yeah, I, did, I thought he had a very good game on, on Wednesday, showed good pace, good reading of the game, used the ball well. And yeah, maybe he did step up, had a bit more responsibility. Certainly the third choice centre back. Uh, I think Lovren, you know, everybody knows his fourth choice. And again, I thought Lovren started quite rustily, unsurprisingly, yeah, he did. In, in midweek. But by the end of the game, he was doing really well and did that clearance off the line to help yeah. to help you the clean sheet. So I think Liverpool are well blessed in that department. I think you mentioned about the attitude of Gomez. I think that's all the way through the team, all the way through the squad, even. That's why I everybody's the way that they are. It was interesting. I know Linders again spoke before the game and he was saying, we haven't got any fringe players, we've, but we've only got, you know, all of the players and some of them play and some of them don't. Mm. But let's be honest, that's not quite true. There are obviously certain players who play a lot more than others. But when they're out there training, I think that they're all, they're all putting each other under the right kind of pressure rather than sitting back and, and bemoaning their, their lot. And I, I think it'll be, it helps at the winning, let's be honest. The, the, the reason that the Matip's playing all the time is because Liverpool have won 15 consecutive Premier League games and he's mm. playing, I think he's started nearly, nearly all of them, hasn't he? If not all of them. And um, that's why he's playing. That's why these players are playing all the time, because they keep on winning. Should Liverpool start getting some negative results, some injuries start kicking in, then it's good to, to know that Gomez is absolutely mm. ready to go. And I think once the international breaks, not so much this one, the next one, after that, you're looking at December, Liverpool have got tons and tons and tons of games yeah. they'll all be important and uh, you would expect him to be starting at least half of those mm. uh, that, and presumably he'll, he'll still be fit by then and that's why Jurgen Klopp has always said he wants his players to be ready and, and they're proving as they proved on Wednesday that they are ready mm. Well the man who was keeping Gomez out of the team Joel Matip was discussed in the press conference today by the boss Klopp said, um, his exact quote was, in a world of big transfer fees signing Joel on a free was incredible one of the best pieces of business we did um, go along with that, Gorsty. I mean, there's, there's, there's little to kind of disagree with there. He's where, where would you where would you have him then? Let's, let's do it slightly differently. A little while ago, me and Theo had a bit of a debate mm. about about free transfers that Liverpool have had in recent seasons and where where Matip would rank. And I think we eventually agreed that he would be third, maybe behind Gary Mack and Milner. Do you think he's deserves to be right up there? Uh, oh, you put him on the spot there. It's a tough one <laughs> because no, I've, I'll, I've held my hands up a few times on this pod and I'll do it again. <coughs> Uh, hands held. Um, I was not convinced by Joel Matip up until maybe as recently as February when he, he came in for the Champions League game, didn't he, against Bayern Munich at yeah. home. Mm. And I remember being slightly concerned that a four-choice centre-back was going to be playing alongside Fabinho against a team as good as them. And since then, he's he's, he's proven me wrong. Um, he's he's been excellent, hasn't he? And um, you look at the, you look at the, the price of centre backs now, and they're in vogue, aren't they, to pay massive fees? Mm. Obviously, Liverpool almost got the ball rolling with that with Van Dijk at seventy five million. Man City paid sixty odd for Laporte. Um, even Otamendi was was over thirty odd. Um, Harry Maguire was eighty million, was he? And Van Dijk, uh, Matip's come in on a free three years ago. Um, so the more you look at it, the, the more you, you you see the Klopp does have a point with that, and 
And you think of the, the cost of defensive partnerships now. Liverpool's is seventy five million, which I'd argue is probably one of the one of the more modest um combinations yeah. with, with Matip and Van Dyke and obviously all of that has has gone on Van Dyke. So yeah, um a, a superb sign and looking back on it, yeah, can't argue with with that. Where would I have him as a free transfer? You remember Gary Mack, don't you, for all for basically that that uh, spring that he had when, when oh. it was between April and May when he just seemed to be you could do no wrong and James Will has been superb for four years. Um so I'd have him somewhere around there. I don't know don't know where he where he'd place one, two or three, but de- definitely in there. Dory, I think our top five was Milner number one, Gary Mack number two, Matt at number three, Aurelio four and Maxi Rodriguez five. That's interesting. No Did Marcus you... Babel. Um he I argued in favour of Babel for the fifth spot. But Theo won on rock, paper, scissors, which meant that um, <laughs> Maxi Rodriguez went in. So, yeah, that uh, was the I, contentious have, one. I don't know about the l- the lower numbers, but I think Milner top, Matip second now. Won the Champions oh, League. He jumped yeah, ahead of Gary Mack. Yeah. yeah. Stars at the Won the Champions, Champions League. League. Yeah. And in a Premier League team, they got nine million points, even if they didn't win it. But, and and he's, you know, he's, he's been a mainstay in a team that's won 15 in a row. What more can he do? And he was also he's very, very good against Chelsea on Sunday. Mm. I know I've not been on the pod since then, but I just feel as though I need to mentioned just how good he is and he has been consistently Liverpool's best defender since the turn of the year I think one thing that's over, always overlooked with Matip as well is um, when he when he was in the, the you know the latter stages of the Champions League with Liverpool it wasn't anything new to him because he was, he was in the semi-final with Schalke wasn't he yeah. mm. in 2011 I good think point that. That, that often gets overlooked and that, that was a point Klopp was making in his press conference where he said he's been around at Schalke for years since about 18 he, he's learnt and he's become a top European defender and it's not a surprise to him that he's doing so well because he was the one who sh- saw that he was available and, and nabbed him on a free transfer or a pre-contract agreement in January 2016. Mm. Interesting, Klopp also made the point that he doesn't perhaps doesn't get the credit he deserves sometimes because he's tall. Yeah, he's a yeah. bit ungainly I'm sometimes a bit like with some of the stuff. Yeah. No, I think <laughs> yeah. it's because My you're, five, five you're, not, you're, not, quite as, you're <laughs> not quite as good as Joel Matip <laughs> and you certainly never play centre-back. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Um, Right, well, we'll move on to the keeper situation, which was also discussed by the boss in his press conference. Doily, um, well, first of all, tell us tell us what was said about Alisson. Where's he up to? He's, he's on the comeback trail. Right, he's been training with the goalkeeper coaches, which we knew anyway. Whether I think, I think it's been about a week now that he's been doing that. I think it may he be. Said, he said, he yes, said he was yesterday, yesterday but yeah. I think he may have been doing it already. Um, but in any case, he's rather hopeful that Alisson will be training with the first team on Sunday. Presumably, they'll be having a warm-down session on on Sunday, or, or whichever players weren't involved in the game on Saturday would be involved. But point being, he'll be training properly with everybody else, whether, even if it's just the goalkeepers. So the calf injury, they've mentioned a few times in the past, it's a serious one for a goalkeeper because they, while it, you think, oh, they don't use the feet that often, well, actually they're using it all the time and they do an awful lot of jumping and you put a lot of pressure on your calves when you're doing that. And as, as Klopp said, you know, Alisson's a bit of a big lad, so he, an awful lot of pressure going on those. So... It's something that needs to be right. I mean, and he also so hopefully he's going to be training from Sunday onwards. Uh, but with Adrian doing so well, Klopp said that there's been no real emphasis or need to to rush uh, rush Allison back. By which by which he explained it may be you know if you've got a positional problem, four or five days you cut four or five days off the rehab. We're not talking like three months. So they did mm. make a bit of a joke saying it's if, if Adrian hadn't been doing that well, that after one week would have said to Alison, get out there, you know, limp yourself <laughs> into the goal. Don't think that would have happened. But it's interesting that Adrian has meant that people just aren't really talking about Alison that much in that sense. They're going, well, just make sure you get yourself ready. I mean, Alison's a better goalkeeper than Adrian. Everybody knows that. Adrian knows that. But... But Adrian is a lot better than a lot of people expected. And well, I think it's helped in that he got thrown straight in straight away. Didn't have any yeah. time to think about it. Yeah. And then he got his mistake out of the way in a game where Liverpool were already winning. To, like like Alice last season. A couple yeah. Of times, yeah. It didn't cost Liverpool in the end. He's made some good saves. Got the early you know bonus of winning the Super Cup, making the save in, in the penalty shootout from Tammy Abraham. So in that sense, he's done everything that needed to be. And... It's hard to remember the last time there was a standing goalkeeper for Liverpool that's done quite as well. Because if you look at Mignolet and Carriers, they weren't standings. They were they were competing for first mm. choice. So neither of those were standings. You, you, Klopp could never make his mind up whether he was first choice between those two. So I'm trying to think, who was the last time a, a standing came in? I mean, I'm old enough to remember Mike Hooper when he came in when Bruce Grobler had 
I think meningitis or something. Oh, they thought Kirkland he had something like... in the Champions League. But, 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 but then, then he was a he, run of games, was it? Scott Carson, maybe. Mm. Steve Scott Carson, but Steve Stone, <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people like that. So, Paul Jones so, did he even play? He, he did, did. He played yeah. a couple of games, but he wasn't. Was he standing? He was only there no, because yeah. somebody Patrick Lucy. You know, so you look at yeah. these names, but they, they only played two, three games. Mm. Or as I'm saying, Mignolet. Like, even when it was like in the early nineties, it was was it Grobelar or James and Friedel came in. They were never standings. They yeah. were actual competing, people yeah. competing mm. for the first place. And I, I, and I don't think Adrian will ever be competing with Allison for the top slot. And I think he knows that. But how many clubs have got? a standing goalkeeper who's done quite so well quite so quickly when you think about it in that perspective then Gosti you almost I don't know you almost feel a bit sorry for him because as soon as Alisson's fit he's going to come back in isn't he there's, there's no question about that but then yeah Adrian's won every single Premier League game he's played in so far he's, he's won a Super Cup and was a key part of that in terms of the penalty shootout alright didn't win the Chargers Shield but Penalty shootout could have gone either way. He wasn't yeah. there then. Was he, that's was the thing. Not, yeah, he wasn't even signed oh, until the there? following uh, day. Yeah, that's how I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah, yeah, went, yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, no, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, then his record's even better than I thought it was. Mm. But, you know, he's, he's going to be displaced as soon as the as the main man's back. Um, I don't know. I guess, you know, you can look back on this spell and it, it'll be incredible memories for him. But is it, I don't know, is it almost a little bit unfair that he's going to be on the bench again soon? No, I, I wouldn't say so because when you pay £65 million for a goalkeeper and they, they win the Golden Glove in the Premier League, then you win the Copper, then they win the Champions League with the Golden Glove, then you win the Copper America with the Golden Glove, this player's got every right to be starting for the team mm. who's bought him. So it was unfortunate Alisson picking up that injury on the opening day of the season. Adrian has come in and exceeded expectation beyond most people's you know, hopes. And uh, he's done great, fair play to him. But I think as soon as Alisson is fit and ready, then... He comes back in, but I think obviously because Adrian has done so well, the need to get Allison back hasn't been so great. And obviously Klopp made that exact point, didn't he? Um, I hope I'm not patronising Adrian by saying that this these few weeks have probably been the highlight of his career. He was mm, training say. with a second division Spanish team over the summer after five years with West Ham, and um, he's come in. He's won the Super Cup. He's playing in the Champions League, making incredible saves against Napoli and. Um, playing for the Premier League leaders and, and deservedly, um, well, deserves to be there on, on form. So, fair play to him. But I think as soon as Allison is 100%, which doesn't look like it's going to be too far away, then I think he comes straight back in. I also think it makes life easier further on the line when, say, the cup games come up and Adrian gets put in. There won't be really yeah. any, any yeah. of that acclimatisation yeah. thing because they'll all know what it's like to, to, to play alongside him. And it may be that Klopp will decide, oh, I fancy... Resting Allison, I mean, why you'd rest a goalkeeper, I don't know, but he may just decide to give Adrian a chance for, for certain games, knowing that he's he's able to do it. And he mm. seems, and he seems the kind of again going back to the attitude and the characters of the, of the players. Klopp's already spoken about how much of a great character is he about the place, and some of the other players have said that as well. Mm. Final point then from the press conference, um, Mr. Professional, as Klopp referred to him, James Milner, going to mention, and I think as we've already said, he, he was another standout player in midweek, despite being twice the age of Harvey Elliott. I think those were probably probably the two main men on Wednesday night. Um, one thing Klopp wouldn't be pressed on, Gorsley, was was Milner's contract situation. Yeah. I mean, obviously he was he was hugely positive about him, the role he plays in the squad, in terms of you know being the, a role model for the young players, not least, but also a, a, a key part of the first team squad. Where, where do you see things? panning out with that though do you think he'll, he'll still be here next season and it will all get resolved uh, I really hope so I think he's got less than 100 days now until he can speak to a foreign club on a pre-contract agreement but I think Liverpool would be foolish to let someone of his experience and quality go for nothing because as you seen the other night he, he was so influential for so many of the young players and, and guided um, a lot of them through that and popped up with a goal and an assist mm. at left back um, just Moved seamlessly into a position he hasn't played for was it, well over a season. That's two seasons. It's a long, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and didn't miss a step. Um, top player, top professional, the most experienced player in, in the whole squad, and not just the what the squad that was out the other night. And um, players like him um, shouldn't be discarded so easily. I'd see no problem with another year at least. He's the, one of the fittest in the squad at the age of thirty-three. No brainer. Um, why wouldn't you? Is, is my answer to that. Mm. Doyle, obviously it's very, very early days, but Leeds, top of the championship. Could you see, if they come up, could you see him potentially going there next season? Or do you think, like Gorsi says, he, he still needs to be part of that Liverpool setup? It's up to him really, isn't it? I, can, I mean, this is a complete hypothetical situation in the terms of, I don't know. But I would. I know that Liverpool have approached him and, and 
Well, there was talks, wasn't there? There was early talks earlier this year, yeah. preliminary talks, and since then there's been nothing as far as... Mm. Certainly that was the, what Milner said a couple of months ago, and I'm not sure whether anything's happened since then, because Liverpool aren't really saying a lot on it. I can only imagine the any kind of thing is that Liverpool were happy to give him one year and he wants more. It's the only thing I can think. I mean, maybe, maybe something completely different. That would be just a complete guess at what I'm saying. But in, in terms of the Leeds thing... I mean, yeah, he's still, what is he, is he 33? He's yeah. 33, mm. isn't he? So on the way that he looks after himself, you can imagine him playing for at least another three, four years at the top level. I mean, there will come a time where his, his legs will actually go because it happens to, to to everybody. And then he has, he'll have to have a think about things. But for him, you know, he's, he's, he's a Leeds... He's a Leeds lad. He's, he's he's done the rounds of all the teams that Man United hate. I think he said this before. <laughs> he said this himself in the past. I mean, who has he played for? He's played for City, City Liverpool, yeah. Liverpool, Newcastle, Newcastle, Leeds as well. It's all the big so, ones, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, for him. I mean, it may just end up being down to him. Maybe he's just he just thinks like I might want to go back to Leeds. I wouldn't be surprised if he did. But as Gorsty said, I wouldn't want him to because. He'll st- he keeps on every single year. It's like you think, oh, man, Milner's not going to play as much this year. And then it's, oh, look, he's playing all the games. You know, like he come on, played a part in the Champions League final by s- helping set up. Okay, he took the corner, but you know, help and waste a lot of time to, at the end. Um, so you know, he, he's got something that you know at the moment none of the other players have got, which is that experience. You look, mm. Henderson's getting towards it. He'll be there, Lalana, but he doesn't. You know, he doesn't play. He, well, he mentioned him, didn't he? He mentioned he mentioned those three: yeah. Milner, Lallara, and Henderson, saying that when they're on the pitch, there's no chance that anybody can be given anything other than a hundred percent. Because he was asked about, is there any kind of suggestion that some of the fringe players who played against MK Dons would, would be thinking, "Oh, MK Dons, why am I playing in this game?" But he said, "Nah." When you've got one of those three on the pitch, in particular Milner, as we saw on uh, on Wednesday, that everybody's given hundred mm. percent, and that's what. The, Again, it comes right back to what we said said earlier about course you said about Gomez and the attitude is that they've all got the right attitude, which yeah. is why when they come in, they want to do their best because they want to play for this this team. Mm, absolutely, you can't buy that, can you? Um, right then, well, let's look ahead to the opponents tomorrow. Start with you, Gorsi. Sheffield United, decent scalp at Everton, level with Man United on eight points after <clears> six uh, games. It kind of feels like, I know there's been a lot of chat about Norwich after their win against City and even ahead of that, they came to Anfield and played well, but... Sheffield probably been the most quietly impressive of the promoted teams. Have you uh, kind of caught your eye so far? Have you? <clears throat> to be honest, they've gone a little bit under the radar, haven't they? But um, I know that they they come up playing this expansive style, which maybe caught quite a few people by surprise in, in the Premier League. And uh, even Klopp mentioned it today with their tactics. Um, Manager Chris Wilder kind of gets the centre backs to to bomb on, which is a, a bit of a strange tactic. But <laughs> It seems, it seems, yeah, yeah, yeah. it seems to be working so far for them, doesn't it? And obviously they got the the draw at Chelsea, which was a great result for them. Um, I think David McGoldrick might be out tomorrow, which is a big bonus for Liverpool. But yeah, um, I think they've basically just just carried on from what they what they did so impressively last season, haven't they? Mm. And I think if they carry on doing that, they will um, they will get points and and hopefully from their their perspective stay up. But um, tomorrow is going to be a really different game for them. I don't think they will have come up against the side with the quality of Liverpool, even allowing for Chelsea at home. So I think it'll be a tough, tough game for them. They might tweak it slightly and um, put one or two more men behind the ball than normal, but uh, it's up to Liverpool to break that down. And I can't really see Liverpool not not coming away with the three points, to be honest. Mm. I think Liverpool will, will be aided by the fact that last season, obviously, Ben Woodburn was at Sheffield United, mm. so they would have paid a, <coughs> a certain amount of attention yeah, certainly the first half of the season as to what was going on with the uh, Bramall Lane. So... They'll have seen, look, if, if Woodburn, he couldn't get in the team because they were playing that well mm. and they ended up getting promoted. So, so yeah, I think that they have gone over the, under the radar a little bit, despite, you know, they got two very good results. But both those good results were away from home. And the home record, I'm pretty sure, hasn't yeah. been massively brilliant. And a lot of the games are really tight. For, so for all this, be, I don't think they've been tonked by anybody, have they? No. Um, they got beat by Leicester at home, didn't they, 2-1? They got beat by Southampton 1-0, was it? That's right. And they, did they draw against Aston Villa or Norwich, or am I just making this up now? They definitely drew an early game. At yeah, home. It was drawn two, one, two, yeah. lost two, and they said they got a positive goal difference. So yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. think they've been spanked by anyone, as you said. Yeah, so I think it's going to be a lot tighter the game than I think people. And also, Liverpool tend not to do very well at Sheffield United historically. They don't have, a, from the top of my head, a particularly great record there. So I've just cheered everybody up there. Yeah. yeah. Was it 2006 was it the last time? So it's going to be a really boring game that Liverpool won't win. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we pick our teams, we'll 
just take a little look at this. Well, this is certainly positive. The Reds have obviously got 15 wins in a row as it stands in the Premier League. Um, and some stats emerged that um, in one of our other podcasts, actually, but I'll just put, put these things to you, to you two guys as well. Three more and three more wins in a row if they get them and they equal City's Premier League record for 18 consecutive yeah. wins. And also the one I didn't know, if um, three more, and that, and that would be nine wins to start the season, would equal a Premier League record set by Chelsea under Mourinho of, of nine in a row at the start. It, these things, of course, obviously, they're, they're, they're great when you get them. And then, you know, at this stage now when they're, almost on the cusp of them, maybe things might be a little bit nervy, but do you think this type of thing would play on the mind of the players or it's more for you know fans and the media to think about? Yeah, I think it's, it's more for the likes of us. Uh, Klopp got asked a similar thing, one of his first questions about the 15 games in a row and he got asked it a couple of weeks back and, and probably a few weeks earlier than that and he just says every time, it's, we just think about the next game, we don't think about these kind of runs and the only time we ever mention it is when it gets brought up in, in press conferences. So I don't think Liverpool players will be in the dressing room tomorrow with, with their eyes on that Manchester City record, I think it'll just be firmly focused on picking up the points and extending the lead to eight points, which will put quite a bit of pressure on Manchester City. You, you travel to Everton later that day, which is not an easy place to go. Mm. The poor fans know that more than anyone. So um, three points early tomorrow will be a, a bit of a statement, to be honest, because I think it, I think that does shift quite a lot of pressure onto City because if they don't win, then it's it's a huge gap already, isn't it, with, with just seven games played? I'd like to talk about Manchester City and corruption, but before you get all <laughs> worried about what I'm going to say, it's how they have corrupted Liverpool's minds in terms of the fans. In that now you're right, no one's thinking about those records. Everyone's just thinking about we need to win the next game yeah. because, and I think it's helped in that sense because that massive run of games just kind of crept up, didn't it? At the start of the season when they mm. won like the first two, and was like, hang on, they've won how many in a row? Yeah, yeah. yeah mm. it's like everyone had completely forgotten. The last time you dropped points was to the Major Derby yeah, in March. It's, yeah. yeah which we often get reminded about yeah, here yeah, by yeah. Uh, some Evan supporting <laughs> colleagues. Um, but yeah, I think what City have, that City have done, it's just channeled the focus. It's almost made Klopp's job so much easier for him. People, at the, the players just clearly are not looking beyond the next game. Mm. You know, unless, it, okay, League Cup game that some of the more regulars were thinking, oh, I'm not playing in that one. But, you know, they're looking at the next League game, for example. So that, that that's all they're not they're looking at. They, I mean, they play Leicester, is it, at home? Next week, yep. next game, Brendan Rodgers return, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That would be a big story, but absolutely no one's thinking about it. Mm. Then when they come back from that, it's Manchester United, another massive game. No one's even thinking about it. So it is like City have done Klopp's job in that sense because it's just made it so much easier to for Liverpool to be a whole bunch of James Milners and being Mr. Professionals. Mm. Right, before we pick the team, I'll put you both on the spot for one final time. There we go. Um, you're right, I agree with you. The game-by-game -game approach is, is clearly the mentality of the squad, but there is <clears throat> there is a bigger picture, which is the Premier League title. And I was looking at the odds the other day, and it's pretty much level pegging uh, between the Reds and City now. Who would you have a favourite for the title at this stage? Doily first. City. Yeah? Un City, City, absolutely no doubt whatsoever. I think Liverpool, they will... What will be interesting is Liverpool don't win a game or, or lose a game. For the last season, the only one they lost obviously was Man City. Mm. They only drew two games before then, which was uh, it was it uh, Chelsea away and Arsenal. Arsenal away. Away. They were the two yeah. games, yeah. and then when they had that little spell where they drew with Leicester, West Ham, Everton United, that's all the games that they didn't win, wasn't it? Yeah, so that's yeah. it. That's all yeah. the games they didn't win. Won. And when they were drawing those games, they were like, ah, oh, oh, it's finished. It's over. They're never going to win it. And all this, it's like, well, you know, okay, but they didn't win it, but only because City got sixteen billion points, and um, I think. It's a fine margin, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> um, but yeah, I think City are still favourites because two reasons. One, they got a bigger squad and two, they know how to win it. Go on, Steve. Yeah, I'm, I'm being inclined to agree. I, I, I agree with Doyle to an extent where it's like one little stumble from Liverpool and not so much in inside the camp but outside the camp, it all comes crashing down, doesn't it? And Everyone's moaning and, and then the mood just completely changes like that after so much good work. You see it happen time and again and there's a lot of bickering that goes on and, and that okay, it won't affect the players as much but just seeps into the fan base a little bit, doesn't it? Um, City have got more options across the squad, um, better equipped to deal with injuries. So City just put Liverpool's lead at this stage of the campaign is... Very healthy, isn't it? Um, only, we've only played six games. Know, six games? Five, five points clear. Exactly, yeah. Mm. It's only six games, so there's a long, so much a long way to go. Yeah. Mm. All right, I might ask this question every week. <laughs> don't, until, don't please until someone do says that. Well, well, the other thing, they don't say the Van City corruption thing. That's the negative. That's the negative to it, that when Liverpool then do 
which they will do because they were not going to win 38 games in a row in this season. I can exclusively reveal that <laughs> on this Blood Red podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but when they do, they, then because City will invariably have won, then it's like panic stations. It's like exactly because yeah. oh, yeah. c- c- you're thinking City are just never ever going to slip up. So when they do, that's why you know they draw with Tottenham at home and in a game that they could easily won easily, and you know, the, the VAR thing at the end, which they played really well. I mean Norwich, they, they lost that one and. City had about 103 percent of the ball, so you know this is hardly a Man City team in crisis, is it? It's One just eight the, nil. yeah, exactly. They just beat Watford eight nil. Eight they, nil. They, and they, what did they do in the League Cup? One three nil. So since they got beat by Norwich, they've scored 14 goals and conceded none. So that's, that's not too bad, is it, for mm. a team that's it, 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 having a nightmare? Mm. So I think City are still the ones and. Yeah, but let's, let's also, Liverpool are quite good at football as well. They are well, the European champions. And they are City indeed. and Liverpool are so far ahead of everybody else, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, the Liverpool team to try and press home the advantage tomorrow and make a bit of a statement ahead of City playing a half five. Uh, at the back, well, it's got to be Adrian, hasn't it? There's, there is, there is yeah. no doubt there. Keller had a good game, though. He did have a good yeah. game, yeah. Very good yeah. save, yeah. 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 He's one for the future, but he's not for tomorrow. So, yeah, he's our goalie. Back line, is it, is it just the usual suspects, Gorsty? I think so. Trent... Robertson, Matip and Van Dijk. Mm. Gomez not case. sneaking in? Um, maybe at right back, but I, I thought Alexander-Arnold was very good against Chelsea and I'd like to see him um, continue. Mm. Uh, Don't you going on? Yeah, can care. Midfield three then, any any surprises there? Fabinho plus two, are we thinking? Oh, it's, yeah, this is an mm. interesting one. I think, yeah, Fabinho plus two. Uh I'd quite like to get Milner in, but I don't think he's going to. Henderson mm. Wijnaldum is going to be. Henderson Wijnaldum. Yeah. Which does, yeah, does feel I'd like... Like, I'd like to see Milner in there because I think it might, might get a bit scrappy in a bit. And he'll, he'll be well up for it, won't he? Yeah. 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 See, so like he hates Sheffield United as well, so... <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps that's Fabinho, Milner, Henderson? I'm going with Wijnaldum rather than Milner. So okay, on. okay. What are you uh, going for? you got the casting vote here. Uh, for me now, I think that... Henderson, Fabinho, one album feels like the the go to. It feels like the first choice three, doesn't it? And yeah. given that none of those featured midweek, did they? So nope. um, I, I just think he'll he'll just go with that again. It's it's a big big game, isn't it? Not that not that Salzburg on Wednesday isn't, but yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna make it two one for that for that trio. Um, and then front three, then Ghosty, start with you. Is it, is well, it again? Manny, Manny's okay, isn't he? Uh, good news on his injury front after his dead leg. He, he hobbled past the mix zone at Chelsea and. Looked a little bit of a, of a worrying one, mm. but Klopp said that he's back today. Um, so you'd have to pick him, and then yeah, Mane and Ib Salah and Firmino. I think Origi might play instead of Mane. Yeah, yeah. on yeah. on the left. Or, yeah, yeah. I've just got a funny feeling. Mm. No, no, no chance for Harvey. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, there you have it. Then I think that probably is the team. I think we've probably certainly got nine or ten of them there. Maybe maybe a couple of little ones for for Klopp to make a big call on tomorrow. Um, but yeah, half twelve, the Reds. Hopefully they get all three points, put a bit of pressure on City going into tomorrow afternoon and make another statement in this title race, make it seven out of seven, and continue their perfect start to the season. We will be back on Monday to dissect the game, look back at that, and look ahead to the Champions League clash on Wednesday. It just doesn't stop in the minute, does it? Two games no. a week for for the foreseeable future. Uh, so thank you for listening today, and we'll be with you again on Monday. Nice one. Are we Are actually stuff? wearing the same shirt? Don't it think is, so. It, are you sure? Yeah. Where's, where's yours from? I can't remember. Mine's from Zara, not that much.